Um, again, we are back on the live stream. And again, if anybody wants to use Twitter or even use the hashtag on Facebook, it's hashtag PlatShift, where you can join in the conversation both online and offline. And we'll be taking questions and having a chance to send those questions back to people after the uh, videos have gone up online. So all of this will be online and all of this will be archived uh, very shortly. So, without any further ado, we're going to spread our wings east and we're going to head towards Zurich, where it's my very great pleasure to welcome Hannes Grassiger. Now, Hannes is actually one of the first post-internet economists. That's what it says in his biography. And his, his pamphlet, called I Am Capital, is one of the things that I think he's going to talk about today. And in terms of some of the theme of this event today, it's certainly around stirring up the idea of how we can affect change, how collectively we can put our ideas, our creativity, and work together to help generate some of those crazy ideas that Kristin was talking about, and some of the revolutionary ideas that Dirk was talking about. So welcome back into the room, and please... Give a big Portuguese welcome, all the way from Zurich via Skype, Hannes Grassiger. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you so much. Uh, I can't actually see you, so everything I see from you is a green dot in the middle of my laptop. So um, let me start out uh, right away. Um, you know, I'm an economist, and you must be really scared, um, but um, I let out all the numbers, basically, and um, you'll see an image-based presentation from me now, and um, it's basically explaining what I'm um, saying in my um, pamphlet called I Am uh, Capital, um, and to digital serfdom, and um, I think... Um, I have, I have prepared two videos that um, make the situation that I'm talking about quite clear. And the first, um, next, that's my book, if you can see it now. And then um, let's start with a video first from 1999. It's a very popular um, German advertisement um, featuring Germans, Germany's beloved um, tennis player um, who acts on behalf of Amazon. And, um, Probably most of you will get what he's saying, and I'll translate it afterwards. Next slide. Ehrlich, ich verstehe absolut null von Technik. Jetzt hat schon meine Frau gesagt, wir müssen endlich ins Internet. Da bin ich doch gar kein Zecki. Bin ich da schon drin oder was? Ich bin drin. Das ist ja einfach. So einfach ist das mit dem AOL Internet Startpaket. Trennen. Neu ab 1.12. AOL 5.0. Der Turbo fürs Internet. Noch schneller. AOL. So what this guy, um, so what this guy says, oh, my wife has told me to go into the Internet. Um, uh, but I'm, I'm not really a tech guy, um, so let me try it. Oh, it's so easy. It's so easy, I'm inside. And um, this is 1999. Now let's go to the next video, please. It's a video about uh, two very ordinary guys um, who, got, who lost their jobs due to uh, the ongoing um, di digitalization of um, the business sphere and who actually found a job offer, but it turns out not to be a real job offer. It's an offer for an internship at Google, and it, the movie was quite a success in the United States in 2013, and I think it's actually, it's, it's actually the, the most amazing criticism of uh, Google and how the whole Silicon Valley mindset works. Let's have a look at it. Now, people have a deep mistrust in machines. Have you seen Terminator? 
or two, mm -hmm. or three, or four. No, John, John, it's an interview for an internship that could lead to a job. Uh, Nick, this might be the last chance that we got. We can see you guys. Okay, good. Yeah, you got it? Hi, my name is Billy. We can hear you fine as well. Oh, great. <laughs> hey, guys, hey, welcome to Google. This will not be your average internship. We're looking at some sort of mental hunger games against a bunch of genius kids with just like a handful of jobs. That's a Sharpie, by the way, genius. That's my fault. Hey, guys, I'm going to get a box to Miles, one of the team managers. Tell me. Oh, you want me just putting the, the fist out without the words is all that's necessary. Come on, bro. Fist me. Get up in there. <laughs> you all interns? Yeah. Shut up. Zero. You're so old, though. I thought you were important. Sometimes the long shots pay off the biggest. That seems a joke. You guys got to start believing. This reminds me of a little girl from a steel town who had a dream to dance. She had to strip down to nothing. She had to sit in that chair and arch her back. And she reached up and pulled the chain to nowhere and doused herself with water. Last dance. Talking about the movie from the 80s. Yeah, you're damn right I am. Oh. We have rules. Red panel indicates no. Green panel, yes. Having a beer with your boss. You want to <laughs> I want to be having a cold one with you. You get hot? Your job? Find the book. Why don't the two of you guys right now go and find the program? His name is Charles Xavier. He's a professor. Stanford. He's in a wheelchair. Got Stanford wheelchair. Yes. Charles Xavier? Very fun. Professor <laughs> Xavier, we know that it's you. We all found me out. Cyclops. Rogue. We're all here. Now, I want to share some of my wisdom with you. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Xavier's a total <laughs> Well, um, 14 years after Mr. Normal um, goes into the internet, Mr. Normal is actually fighting for an unpaid internship at the core of the new power thing called Google. And that's a very radical change. And um, Next slide, please. So um, another two pictures that make that change really obvious. Um, I'm, I'm working for um, uh, journals and newspapers as an uh, economic um, uh, writer and business writer. And so this is how uh, the newspaper world looked um, like 30, 40, even maybe even 20 years ago. Next slide. And this is how it looks today. And basically, it looks the same. But there's one difference. Because in the newspaper business, um, you would read the paper and that's basically it. Today, these machines that you're reading, they are reading you. So <laughs> another market is, has come into existence, another flow of information that hasn't been there before. And um, next slide. Um, a lot of things have changed. We're like all on Facebook. Next slide. There's this big thing called the Silicon Valley. Um, we hear about it every day. Everybody wants to be like the Silicon Valley in the industry. Next slide. And all of that is actually going to grow. We've heard about the Internet of Things. So, um, next slide. The companies who are part of this whole thing have actually taken over. This is the Financial Times 500 list, ranking the 500 most uh, uh, money companies in the world. Uh, you see Apple ahead of Exxon Mobile. Um, this is very symptomatic. Um, next slide. Some people think this change is so big, so enormous, it's actually kind of an evolutionary stage. One of these guys, that's him, Kevin Kelly, he's the lead editor and founding member of Wired magazine, which is actually the voice of Silicon Valley, distributed globally. One of the few print magazines that work really well. Next slide. Others would say this is another industrial revolution. So people would either, either say it's the third or the fourth uh, industrial revolution after um, electrification and stuff. And um, this whole new, um, next slide please, this whole new era has also developed its own four heroes. Here's one of them. And um, this is where public debate is currently uh, focusing on, or mostly at the moment I was writing my book. So I, as an economist, was really, really annoyed about everybody just talking about what has happened to us in political terms. And I actually thought people are not seeing what is happening because 
what the NSA and other uh, government uh, agencies tried was just to get the data that was with the companies. So um, what's happening on the company side is even more interesting because we've seen, the, basically we've seen the government agencies being a terrible thing. All of their internal slides are public, you can watch them online now, but you don't have a clue what's going on on the company side. So I thought it might be worth to look at, next slide, what's the, what's the real deal happening currently. So there's a saying in the industry that people are argue data is the new oil. And if you look at that image, um, you see this is data that comes from this smartphone, a house, a pen, or a, a gaming um, tool. This is personal data, but if personal data is actually the new oil that makes um, Apple or uh, Google become one of the most powerful companies and uh, most money companies in the world, why then am I not, next slide, the shake? Because all this information comes from me. It actually wouldn't exist without me using my smartphone and stuff. And so I was investigating this, next slide, and to understand why companies who don't charge you anything have become so incredibly rich. You need to understand what has happened to us. Next slide. So this is actually the first digital man. This is 1964, it's called the Boeing Man, and if you really look at it, it's a generic thing. It, it, it is not really a person. What this person, what this thing needs to become a person is a face. So skip 40 years forward, 2004, this is Facebook beginning. It's a tool where you enter all sorts of personal information. Next slide, please. But this is not enough, this is just a part of what you are. You see in the middle of this uh, image, you see a thermostat. This is what Google paid $3.2 billion for. Um, this is something that connects your environment, your living sphere, and what you're doing, the room temperature, and what you're saying to the digital sphere. So, next slide, please. This is why I was showing this uh, I'm back um, thing at the beginning. I think the most underrated ideology of this beginning new digital era is personalization. We have to understand that a new form of being is currently in the making, a new form of human being. Next slide, please. Um, data has to be connected to the living being. This is one of the tools, it's called Foursquare. It's an app that shows your physical position in the context of the city, that shows you where your friends are and which place they would go to and how they think about it. And this, and this whole connection between body and um, data is ongoing. Next slide, please. This is one very classic example. You see us connecting our fingerprints, so our body, to all that data flows that come from the smartphone. So in the database of Apple, there's an, a unique fingerprint. Your body is connected to everything they will record about your body. And so next, the big game that's happening currently, if we look at um, it economically, is that there's a couple of major companies competing, you know, Facebook, Google, um, there might be Microsoft in the game. These guys are competing over who will take it all, because in network economies, there's a very basic law. It says the winner takes it all, meaning the one company who achieves to get the complete digital image, the data fight person will actually take all the gains and um, the major share of the revenues in the market. Next slide, please. This is what we call completion. Um, let me give you an idea how it's being carried out strategically. Next slide. So the first method is you recording yourself. This is basically Facebook and all these applications that you're using where you are entering information about yourself. All the stuff, next slide please, that you cannot tell about yourself is being recorded externally. So there's you yourself recording what you're doing and then there's external observation. Next slide please. And there's two dimensions to it. First dimension is, this is just an email. Actually an email is an exchange of thoughts. 
So um, it's basically everything you can verbalize. Next slide. And then the other half of it is things or aspects of yourself that you are not able to verbalize. Which this is a Fitbit. Um, actually, this was um, a punishment. Only 10 years ago in Germany, people would get electronic wristbands if they um, uh, would be um, punished by uh, a, a court for, uh, and they shouldn't move around and to report their movements. They had to wear these electronic wristbands. These days, we are paying 120 uh, dollars for them, sending all this data somewhere. And this is physical stuff and. Um, about ourselves, it's our steps, our heartbeats, things we couldn't even enter um, because we're not really aware of what's, what, what it all is. And so now I give you a very brief overview of uh, um, these tools and their progression in the, in the recent uh, years. Next slide, please. This is LinkedIn. LinkedIn is a method of data find our business networks. A lot of people are using it either LinkedIn or Xing, and actually what they're telling the owners of LinkedIn um, is who they're connected with, with whom they are really interested in getting in touch with, all of that. Next slide. Um, another aspect of us that has been identified um, by Twitter um, is our very first thought, our ethics, our first emotion. During, for example, um, football matches, a lot of people are tweeting like their emotions on um, uh, Twitter, so all of that can be recorded and uh, can be used. Next thing. Next slide. So uh, this is an emoji tracker. You've always wondered why these emojis were free on your phone. Actually, this emoji tracker, which you see here, is um, for the purpose of uh, uh, quantifying which emoticons are being used the most currently. And what you can do is you can connect the emoticons that are being sent by your phone to a, a, a geographical position, which would enable companies to see to create emotional landscapes where you can see which kind of feeling is around in this area or that area. Imagine somebody selling roses in Central Point. If you would have the information where most hearts are being uh, sent around, that would be interesting to him. Imagine a weapon seller, uh, a weapon trader in uh, Somalia, if he knew where the worst um, emotions are, the most hatred is, he'd go there. So this is a market that already exists. Next slide. And um, this is a code element called Flurry that is part of 90% of all smartphones. Because this is a, an element that is given for free to developers of applications which you download on your smartphone. And the developers just pay in sharing the personal data they get from these, um, they get from these applications. You might have heard about the torch that was actually registering where you are. Um, next slide, please. This is a book in the digital age, and what this book does is it creates a unique perspective of what the reader is actually interested in intellectually. This is a great opportunity for everybody who wants to know what you are really thinking about these days, because you're taking notes on this thing, because also you're skipping from one page to another. This creates a perfect profile. Next, please. What you see here was once called the iWatch, now they call it Apple Watch, and it has, if you look at it on the back side, it has a lot of sensors on it. This is like a smartphone, but you wouldn't take it off at night, probably. It's ever closer. That is the idea, to connect data to your body and to create that unique person. This is also why, next slide, Google just teamed up with Levi's and presented its first intelligent variable uh, uh, fiber textile um, because textiles actually are an amazing market for companies like Google that want to know a lot about you because it's so close to you. All sorts of information can be gathered. Next slide, please. This is a new offer, uh, Black Pro by ROB. It's actually sending the data of what's going on in your mouth. <laughs> Um, if you remember when you were a child, like the first thing the doctor would do, and he would look into your mouth because it tells so much about you. Okay, if you buy this, you're sharing this information with somebody. Next slide, please. <laughs> this is an amazing new development offered in the American market already. It's called the Amazon Echo. 
Amazon Echo is kind of a personal assistant. You can, it's like a cylinder that size, and you can put it in your room, and you can ask Echo everything, literally. And Echo is also always listening. So um, <laughs> Echo, with Echo you can shop for free, but actually Echo is a full-on recording device that you pay for. Next. And even if you think, so what you see here is the smart city, scape. Even if you think, I don't use any of those things, I throw it all away, I'm not participating, you'll in the future walk through cities that have sensors everywhere because sensors have become incredibly cheap thanks to the smartphone. A, 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 an ordinary smartphone carries around 20 sensors to just record. And this means that fridges, smart, your smart fridge, your smart watch, your smart TV, uh, your smart car, your smart building, everything is recording. There are smart grids around that record how much electricity is being consumed. So there is no way out. And even if you think next slide, you're going to an, era, an area where there's no internet, Facebook and Google are actually charities. They send out drones and uh, balloons currently to the areas of the world which suffer from an under um, nourishment of um, internet connection. <laughs> And um, this um, also actually um, Tesla is taking part in that race. So at the internet, that's the idea, is being sent for free to these poor people who have no connection. If they access it via a tool that is only like a smartphone that would only be provided by Facebook. So they're actually entering all of their information to through the Facebook or Google channel. Um, next slide. And if you think um, there's a limit to it, Look at this, 23andMe is one of those companies that are actually um, helping you to find out um, what kind of um, personal, where you're from, what your family is from, like which descendants. A lot of people from the United States want to know where their families originally came from. Also, a lot of people want to know which diseases they might want to suffer and die from. So, um, 23andMe is an incredibly cheap, uh, colorful, fun service where you can send a hair or a, a little bit of um, uh, spit um, to, to them and you get actually results, next slide please, on the screen, so it's all in the cloud, where you're from and all of that stuff. So somebody from the New York Times actually tested out, compared these services, the others in the United States are far more expensive, this is just a 23 and me, it's just like, it's basically it's $100 or $200. Um, and the other services would normally be like $2,000. Basically, everybody gave her a different result. So what you get for your $100 is basically nothing. But what they get is your source code. It's your DNA. And actually, with your DNA, I can also quite easily calculate your family's, your relative's DNA. There's already over um, a half a million um, U.S. citizens in their databases. And guess what? Next slide. Who's the investor and who founded that company? No, it's not the guy to the right. This is uh, Sergey Brin, co-founder of Google. It's his ex-wife, uh, Anne Wojcicki. Um, she actually provided the garage um, where Google was being uh, started first. And Google later on made the first investment into 23andMe. And guess, next slide, where all that data goes? It goes into the cloud, meaning it goes out of your hands. Next slide. And that's where the whole business thing starts. Um, as we've heard, data is a commodity, it's personal data. That's the main commodity, data that relates to personal the sphere. Next slide, please. And already in 2012, this report came out on the World Economic Forum. That's a, a, a meeting in Switzerland, which most of you might have heard about. It's in Davos, uh, where economic and political leaders um, assembled to discuss important uh, issues. And they had, a, um, they had a think tank, actually, in the back. And that think tank was, um, was issuing this um, report, Personal Data, the Emergence of a New Asset Class. What, it, what is an asset class? An asset class is um, labor is an asset class. Money itself is an asset class, land is an asset class. So what they are saying, a new form of capital is arising. And how is that capital being used? Next slide. There's a whole market, kind of an ecology, where companies 
are exchanging this data for the purpose of research about customers, for the purpose of addressing them via uh, advertisements. And really just think that advertisement, personalized advertisements that react to your online behavior or your movements on your phone, this is just really a product. It's a personalized product, which means there's a lot more products to come up soon. Like if they find out my baby likes other colors better, they might in the future detect this through smart toys, which exist already, and create a personalized optimal all for her. What's the problem? Next slide, please. One of the problems arising is that there's a total restructuring of our society. A very important part of our society is the price system. The price system actually, actually regulates what you buy, what things you have access to. So I found out that supermarkets um, and retailers in the United States and in Germany are currently trying out personalized pricing, which means the guy on the left and the girl on the right in that room have a different preference for milk, for example. So one would be really a lover of milk, the next person really, really doesn't like milk, he prefers soy, and you can come up as a supermarket and make an offer to the person who really doesn't like milk to give him milk for a really cheap price, and that person who just bought uh, probably um, cereals just beforehand put cereals in her shopping bag, you know that she's actually very, very much likely to buy milk, so you can charge her more. So two people went, will end up at the cashier's desk and they will pay a different price, which can happen in all spheres. You know this buying uh, flight tickets online, like your friend has a different prices. It's already part of our society, and think about what prices are regulating. And even Next slide, please. Even if you're doing this without a smartphone, if you're going to the supermarkets, they have technology <coughs> in place in Switzerland. Um, on, <laughs> we're, not, we're not the leading company in this. Um, they have technologies in place that would just detect from your visual appearance, from your facial expressions, what you're likely to think about this and that product, and could in real time uh, change the data fight, uh, the digital price prices in front of you or um, push information on your smartphone your uh, devices. So this whole restructuring, next slide, of society is very visible in that image. So to the left, um, this serious guy is um, the, this guy is um, Eric Schmidt of Google. He's the head of their board. Um, and to the right, that's the guy with whom you wrote a book that's Jared Cohn. They both wrote The New Digital Age. This book actually tells you um, what is going to happen, what Google is thinking about um, the, the next five to ten years. And Jared Cohn actually was from the Council on Foreign Relations, which is the most powerful uh, US think tank. So this is a power person. You know what he did after writing the book with Eric Schmidt? He changed positions. He is now working for Google. Next slide. Um, we see this everywhere. This is Condoleezza Rice. She's part of Dropbox, the cloud service, uh, where you probably upload your data to. And next slide. So when they actually, when it became public that all these government agencies are collecting data, thanks to Snowden and thanks to Assange, um, what these um, companies did, they actually got in competition. They signed a letter together. You see on the bottom of that um, open letter to Washington, you see AOL, Microsoft, LinkedIn, Facebook, Apple, Google, Yahoo, joining forces. They sent out a warning to the governments in the world that they should stay away from the internet because it's there. And next slide. This is um, how you do it. This is how you give it all away because you're actually using the internet and signing all these terms and conditions every day, over and over again. And I was reading these terms and conditions, which is a really boring thing to do, but actually if you dive into it, it becomes really interesting. For example, I found this uh, amazing regulation that most, um, that most terms and conditions would feature, that you actually don't have a right to go to court so if you want to sue Microsoft for something they did wrong, you have to go to a private court in Santa Clara County, which is in the Silicon Valley, 
and you're not allowed to do this and that under a certain threshold of money and all of that stuff. Actually, you're, you're using, or this is what they want to make you lose your right to go to court. Next thing is a, a really, a really nice um, phrase. They most of these companies um, have in their terms and conditions. It says. Shibabai, I agree that um, you can change the terms and conditions at, least at any time, even without giving notice. And the third, the third thing I found um, <coughs> over and over again, a twi uh, actually uh, WhatsApp, the text messaging service, uh, wrote it in the nicest way. It says, we can exclude you from our services for any or no reason. <laughs> So, I found we are actually being robbed of all these rights and powers that we have fought for during the last hundreds of years in democratic societies. And there's a new class of people that offered us new territories, free land that we could live upon, and now that they are reaping the harvest, they tell us if we if we don't accept these terms and conditions, they exclude us, means they, they could just leave. So this kind of reminds me, next slide, of something we in Europe um, have known for centuries. This is serfdom. So I'm arguing that we, without noticing it, have been sliding into an economic form that is serfdom and nothing else. So what, next slide do about it. I mean we've seen we've seen governments try to fight um, with companies. We've we've seen um, we've seen a lot of approaches. We've seen people going into um, uh, uh, encrypting all of their emails. We've seen the rise of ad blocking like two hundred million people globally are currently using ad blockers um, just to disconnect from this uh, new market sphere. And as I said before, we cannot just leave it. And also, there's a lot of things that I really like about it. A lot of services that most of us would use every day. Next slide. And it's all based on personal information. So this has always been this has always been the main source of businesses. It's about contact. It's about what you know about people. Next. So what this guy did is actually a major inspiration to my book. He, this guy is an artist called Sean Buckles, and he, by uh, understanding what's currently happening, had the idea to auction his personal data. So he was offering full-on access to his computer, like plug into his computer, uh, putting that plug, and what he got was uh, $7,000 uh, for one year of his personal data. This is, is this just one random um, one random trial? So I went to uh, do a little bit of research, and I found companies who are currently in that phase uh, offering you the possibility to sell your personal data and um, to kind of collect everything you're doing on Facebook and all of these services and sell it to them, and they would uh, give you a part of what they make with it, like a share. Um, and also what I found was a study that was really exciting by Boston Consulting Group um, who in 2012 already um, asked over 3,000, uh, more than 3,000 experts on um, uh, data and uh, the data business, personal data business, um, and they figured that in the year 2020, so in five years ahead, um, the European market will be worth one trillion United States dollars which would break up to $2,000 for all of the 500 million people who live in the European area. Which is roughly, if you look at that, this is data that applies for everyone, from a child to a senior person to a working person. So this is just a rough estimate. So $2,000 a year for a family of four would make $8,000. And um, this is a lot of money. This would uh, break down to pay your rent with it. 
And so this is all what we are losing currently. So I will suggest in one book next time um, that we should start. We are already marketing ourselves. We are already uh, trying to create favorable images of ourselves on, on great many platforms. And I think you know, um, you see this very clearly. Um, I was arguing that we should actually put all the personal data that we are currently creating put it in a box by encrypting it and making it um, something that third parties who would be interested in it cannot use because it's totally encrypted. These technologies already exist. Um, we put it in that box. And if somebody, for example, interested in my uh, geographical, in my movements, he could come to me through an automated service. These things already exist do an automated service and ask, hey, uh, what would you want for your uh, geodata? And I would actually rent it out. So imagine, in the future, a pair of shoes, for example, for mine. If these guys would know where I'm actually walking around, they would know what kind of street, what kind of uh, social environment I'm entering. So I would be able to make a perfect shoe and actually, it's all based on my personal data. So I could start charging them for this data, and they would need to pay me for it. Think of all those people who are, like the video we saw at the beginning, who are about to lose their jobs in the future, in the very near future, thanks to artificial intelligence and algorithmic developments. Where will they earn their money from if they are not something to use this new digital asset. And that's the that's basically yeah, the yeah, total sellout, but a controlled sellout. Because the current situation is that everything is being taken away from us and we don't have neither control rights nor get we nor do we get any form of payment for it. So in my model, if we would encrypt and put our personal information in that, that box, we would also be able to say what we are not giving out. And we would also be able to formulate our own terms and conditions. And that's the basic idea. So that's it. <laughs> Thank you. No, I know. We, we could hear the response there, Hannes. That was amazing. And thank you for your inspiring talk there. And that really provoked me. I was in the middle of about to send a retweet out. And to retweet that, I suddenly had a thing. Like, do I retweet this or do I not? I was in a dilemma. I retweeted. But the fact is that we do live in this particularly changing world. And you've brought some really important insights to the debate and to the discussion here today for all of us as artists and creators, technicians, innovators, and people who are working in this space and navigating our way through this. And we are discovering in this wild west. And I know we're a little bit sort of slightly out of time, but if you have a time, are there any particular questions people would like to ask Hans? We've probably taken a couple of questions, and if not, we can then fire them back uh, electronically afterwards. But anybody want to ask a question to Hannes here now? Is there an English print of the book? Yes. Is the book published and printed in English? Um, so there's an um, uh, English abstract. Um, here you see. Um, it's, it's been featured on Motherboard, which is uh, the Vice.com. Um, was a problem uh, techno area. Uh, uh, there, I've, I've been asked a lot of times, and there have been, it's, it's, it's crazy. Like, in, I heard from people from Sweden in Svenska Dark about it, there was a review. So it's, it's currently circulating. I don't know what's happening, but I'm looking for an uh, ink publisher. 
And here's, here's the interesting dilemma, Hannes. What about it was a Google translation project and became an open source Google opportunity for people to translate that for you globally? How would that feel? Um, I, I think, um, and what I'm doing, so what I'm doing currently is I'm participating, so I'm talking to you over Skype, I'm participating and I'm using these means, um, not in the sense I would love to use them, I would actually pay for Skype, um, Skype would not use my personal information in a perfect world, or Skype pay me for uh, my personal information in that very moment we're talking. So what I'm currently doing is I'm using these these existing means, but I'm trying to inform uh, people that they are uh, giving away their uh, data. So currently I would be happy, but knowing how crappy the Google translations are, I'm very happy that it's being carried out by um, people because you wouldn't understand what, what I'm talking I tried it out with Google, it's, it's well, fun. Well, maybe, maybe through this platform shift project, maybe we can find someone to translate it or if, with your permission or whatever to have a, a conversation and we can extend that conversation so it can reach a, a wider a, a wider public and extend the discussion i think what is really what is really a point for people like you who are in the public sphere is um look at universities for example a lot of universities are currently uh, being approached by platforms that are telling them to host their online courses um, and so what the universities are giving away is all the student data, so all the students that are using these online platforms that are creating massive amounts of like personal information and um, I think if you are setting up um, a place that use such systems, you should be aware of um, what kind of information you're currently gathering and to whom you're giving it. Thank you. Well, I'm sure that we've, we've got plenty to talk about, and thank you for being an inspiring speaker along with everybody else this morning. Thus far, we haven't finished yet, but thank you very much indeed for joining us from Zurich. So another big round of applause for Hannes. Thank you.